Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, well, I've got one apology today from Kenneth Gibson, uh, who unfortunately can't make it, but we're delighted to have David Torns, MSP, in his place as subject. Thank you for coming along. David, and we move to Agenda Item 1, which is Decision on Taking Business in Private. The Committee will agree whether to take Item 5, Consideration of Correspondence from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in Private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yes. Okay, thank you. We now move to Agenda Item 2, uh, on the Small Business Bonus Scheme, and the Committee will take evidence on evaluating the Small Business Bonus Scheme to inform its response to the Scottish Government on the proposed terms of its review of the scheme. So, we have... Quite a few witnesses this morning. Uh, can I welcome, I'll run through them all at the same time. Uh, Stuart McKinnon, External Affairs Manager, Sco Scotland Federation of Small Businesses. Ian Milton, President. And Alistair Kirkwood, Vice President, Scottish Assessors Association. Marianne Barker, Non-Domestic Rates Policy Manager. Ross Henderson, Assistant Economist. And Marina Curran, Statistician, Scottish Government. And Richard Marsh, uh, Director for Consulting. You are all very, very welcome. I'm sure you'll appreciate with so many witnesses we're not going to ask any opening statements uh, from you, uh, but perhaps I'll just start off with <coughs> a really obvious question to ask in relation to the Small Business Bonus Scheme, and that is, well, what measures would, would you actually use if you wanted to impact, uh, evaluate the impact of the Small Business Bonus Scheme in relation to, for example, boosting economic growth? So what kind of measures would you be looking at to evaluate that scheme? Who'd like to go first on that? Mr. Marsh, you can. Sorry, I, I think um, just briefly in my submission, what what we've we've asked the question, what's the objective of the small business bonus scheme? So you've you raised the point there, say so how would you measure its contribution towards economic growth? I think before we start to go into the details of specific questions of what the scheme's achieved, it's important in any evaluation to set out what was the scheme meant to do. So if the scheme is meant to boost economic growth, then that's a very clear objective. And if it's meant to help uh, small businesses survive longer, thrive, establish themselves in rural communities, then that's something we can evaluate as well. So before we sort of went into the, the, into the data and say, how would we actually kind of measure these things, it's important to say, what is it we're trying to measure? It, it, in, t in terms of um, the contribution towards economic growth, there's a vast reservoir of data that the Scottish Government has access to, which links um, the performances of businesses and the different units within businesses, their turnover, their value added, their contribution towards the economy of Scotland, investment, the wages paid, and how much they pay in business rates. Now, we can access that data, and we've tried to give you a couple of, of short examples how you can do that to say we can measure the characteristics of the businesses in receipt of the small business bonus scheme against perhaps those that don't, against those that might cross above or below the threshold and see what differences can be recorded. That, that would be a good first step. Okay. Uh, anyone else? And, uh, and we'll maybe just put, because we, we all have a discussion about what you believe the purpose should be of the small business bonus scheme, but two specific things to bear in mind is uh, you know, the impact, positive or otherwise, it's had in small businesses uh, at the margins to keep them trading or expand or economic growth more generally. But, you know, how, what, what would other witnesses be looking at to evaluate to see if it's been successful? But you're quite right, Mr Marsh, we have to identify what outcomes we're trying to achieve at the outset before we can actually quantify some of that. Anyone else? Uh, Stuart McKinnon. If, I think... Um, you know, we welcome the committee's uh, interest in the, in the small business bonus scheme, and um, I think we have to recognise the, the work of the Barclay Review and what good work they did, uh, looking at ways to improve the rate system at, at large. Um, just a, a, cu a couple of points. I think we have to remember that. Uh, small business rates really for the, was one of the first things that this, this parliament um, implemented and the reason for implementing such a measure was because there was evidence that business rates made up a larger proportion of smaller firms turnover uh, than their than their larger counterparts so it was introducing an element of uh, fairness into the into the system and um, we then saw similar schemes being established in, uh, in, in in England and Wales but we accept that it's perhaps about time that we look at um, 
look at the scheme and see if it's working as well as we can. We would encourage any uh, review or evaluation not just to be uh, backward looking, but also look to the future. Mm. Ask the question, how best can we support our uh, our small business community? Um, I think that if you look at our uh, our submission, we, we suggest three principles. You know, um, first of all, it's the small business bonus scheme should all be a, always be about small businesses. Um, how do we best help uh, small businesses thrive? How to ensure as many businesses as possible uh, thrive? We, we also uh, would highlight that this is a, you know that this is a measure that directly affects uh, local communities and local town centres or high streets, which are uh, I know very important to MSPs uh, around this this table. How do we be best ensure that this scheme and other elements of the rate system um, help our, our local town centres and our local communities thrive? And lastly, we would uh, argue that any review should have the broadest possible perspective. So um, consider where we are with the with the, the rise of the digital economy, with the rise of uh, with, with the rise of new ways of trading, with the rise of home-based businesses, and uh, you know, in the context of a likely difficult uh, economic period um, on the horizon. Okay, can I, can I move just before to someone else and just ask you to how you would quantify what success would look like in some of those things so looking back as well as looking forward so you've mentioned that uh, a greater fairness vis-a-vis -vis tax reliefs and support for small businesses and larger businesses you think was one of the key things for this form of rates relief uh, so you I think you're saying you believe that's been achieved, but you have to look again at how you sustain that. I don't have the words in your mouth, I will let you come back in relation to that. But you also mentioned how small businesses survive and thrive. Uh, I think that was the expression you used. Um, so what data would we look at to make sure that these small businesses have survived and thrived? Well, we could look, we could look at uh, business population statistics. We know that the that uh, the number of small businesses in Scotland is at a, uh, is at a record high in the, in the last few years. Although they've just come down in the, in, in the last year, um, we would we could also look at uh, occupancy rates in town centres and high streets, as uh, Mr. Mr. Marsh uh, mentioned. We could um, also, from our perspective, it'll be really important in any study that we get qualitative data from real business owners to, to, to try and understand what difference the schemes to makes to them. Okay, um, thank you. Some other comments on that would be helpful? Um, uh, Marianne. By what the actual in original intention was behind the small business bonus when it was introduced in 2008, and it is, as Stuart said, it was because non-domestic rates constitute a higher proportion of overheads for smaller businesses than they do for larger. It was about introducing fairness into the rate system. And it was also about sustaining and uh, growing small businesses. That was the original policy intent in 2008. Okay, and how would the Scottish... I, I, I'm just going to use survive and thrive because it's quite a good tagline. So how would the Scottish Government measure the success of small businesses in receipt of this relief, surviving and thriving? I mean, we haven't, about the evaluation, we haven't made any predetermined decisions as to how we will evaluate. And I know when Mr Mackay was before you, the committee on, I think, the 17th of January, he made an offer for the committee to feed into that. We haven't made any decision as to how we will evaluate. My analytical colleagues might have some views as to the different methodologies that they could use, but we haven't made any decision as to how we will actually evaluate it. I, I mean, in fact, yeah, I see Ross Henderson wants to add to that, so I'll... Leave my comments. Just kind of add on to what uh, Richard was saying. It's, I guess, the approach you take to any kind of policy. This is really just do a sort of cost-benefit analysis. So you kind of want to just compare, you know, what were the results against the kind of original objectives. Uh, you know, maybe establish some sort of counterfactual in terms of, um, you know, if we hadn't implemented this policy, what may have happened. Uh, you probably want to establish maybe some non-market benefits uh, of the policy. So uh, if we, if you know, the committee considers it important to look at. The importance of keeping high streets alive. Um, you know, people might value the existence of uh, shops in their high streets, and you might, you could maybe look at that through kind of qualitative measures, maybe like a survey uh, of businesses, and that may be a kind of approach you would take uh, to evaluate it there. I suppose the thing I'm hearing is approach you would take. The small business bonus has been about for for, for, for a few years. I, I mean, I, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of it, but all my support comes from anec anecdotal information. So apologies. Mr Marsh, I know this isn't the evidence you're looking for, but let me give you one bit of anecdotal information that I don't know if will be captured anywhere. So I've got a, a new large gym set up in my constituency called New, new Life Gym. They did qualify for the small business bonus in Finiston, uh, but given the commercial rents and the success of that area, they wanted to expand, they couldn't afford, they wouldn't qualify for the small business bonus, so they've moved to a, 
a fantastic new gym in Mary Hill, which is breathing a bit of regeneration into an area of my constituency. So I welcome that that has allowed that business to move from one part of Glasgow into my constituency and boost my constituency, but I don't know whether to view that as displacement or view that as success or how I view that within small... or, or whether, that's tra whether that's relevant in the slightest or whether that's tracked more generally in the, the, the actual... Uh, business response uh, from companies out there who move about to seek these reliefs. So who's monitoring this kind of stuff? That that would seem to be a reasonable indice of success in my constituency that that's happened, and for Finison that's that's now thriving. But who's more who, who's capturing that information? Oh, I Show suppose I, I can I can speak to the the, the survey work that uh, the FSB's done over the over the years. So we've uh, taken uh, evidence from our, our members on on a couple of occasions about the value of the of the scheme. I think it's great to hear about a business doing well in uh, in in your constituency. But I would highlight that most businesses aren't mobile. You know they don't uh, they don't they don't move about. Uh, they're rooted to their community and their uh, and their their high street. Um, the, the 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 survey the most our most recent survey work is detailed in our submission to Barclay, which I, I I highlighted to the to the committee. But we asked our uh, members what would happen if the the scheme was cancelled. About a fifth said that they would uh, amend their plans for growth. Another fifth would uh, consider downsizing, and a similar proportion said they would uh, cancel plans for for investment. So I think, um, you know, we, as I'm as I'm now, obviously we're a, we're a small business membership body. Um, we, you know, we 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 campaign on behalf of our members. But if evidence from small businesses is, is what you're looking for, we, we've done we've done our bit. Uh, so plans plans for growth that could mean taking on a, a second employee or a third employee or a new part-time member of staff. Is any of that monitored? Mr Marsh. Just it, a very brief, brevity point. Um, your example about the gym is is superb. And we were talking earlier about an example I had from my hometown in Kirkcaldy, very similar, of a, of a larger small business on the high street that moved to a different property on a side street because the rates were too high for them to expand the way they wanted to. What we need to do at the outset of this is to put all this anecdotal evidence down. It's absolutely, it's the vital part of the evaluation to set down what are the stories across Scotland of how that has the system worked in reality. I'll put forward maybe I'll, some disagreement here in the panel, but one of the issues is will the scheme help to small businesses survive and thrive? Possibly. By far the biggest impact I would suggest would be it encourage them to take a different property than they otherwise would have taken. So they might be rooted in, the, in their community, but it was certainly encourage them to take a different unit, to operate from a different premises than they might have otherwise done. Given that, what is the impact on their business? So does your gym, is it actually operating better in that different unit than they would have taken if it was just an open market? Oh, I didn't know that was a question to you, Mr Marsh. You'd have to ask, have to ask the gym. I'm sure they'd be, del they'd be delighted. Mm. I don't want to explore that anecdotal story that I gave because that would be indulgent of myself as the constituency MSP. It's just the point about their anecdotal story after anecdotal story after anecdotal story of the success of the small business bonus scheme for individual businesses, but it doesn't seem to be captured in a systematic way to make sense of the story across Scotland. Because there could be anecdotal stories where it's not been successful and perhaps those aren't been captured. So how is the Scottish government trying to capture some of this information? We haven't done any formal evaluation of the Small Business Bonus Scheme since it was introduced. Again, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence um, in support of the scheme, uh, but we haven't done a formal evaluation. But we have accepted the Barclay recommendation to do so. OK, before I let, let, let some other members in, can I, can I maybe ask the panel then, what, what would success look like? So I'm mentioning it could be a business being able to expand, such as the, the anecdotal evidence that I... That, that, that I gave to committee, it could be taken on a second employee. Um, what 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 would success look like to, to the witnesses then? Because if we work out what success, success could look like, we could start to work out how we're going to monitor some of this stuff. So th there's two examples. Would you all accept those are those could be two positive examples, allowing a business to grow rather than be squeezed out because of a market heating up in one part uh, of, of of the economy, uh, or taking on additional members of staff? Would would that indicate success? 
those could be some measures of success, but I would highlight that it's not all about growth. You know, I think we're going to, you know, in, a, in an upcoming d difficult economic period, we might need to pay, play defensively with the with the economy. Um, not every, you know, there's an awful lot of businesses out there that are uh, single person enterprises that don't have stratospheric plans for growth, but should still be treated fairly by the uh, by the rate system. Um, and I think that we have to ensure, you know, one of the key measures for us is does it uh, introduce um, fairness into the into the system? Does it uh, make it the rate system easier for uh, small rate payers to uh, navigate and um, while I cannot, you know, while there, there is clear evidence from our members that it helps our, our growing members to, to expand, um, we would caution against uh, growth be the only measurement in this review. Absolutely, so, so, so that would be there. So resilience during tough economic times and ability to continue to trade may be one of the how you capture that, I'm not sure, but that's one thing we could use to capture evidence of the success. Fairness could be it could be an overarching principle. Um, what else? What else are we looking at? What what would success look like, Mr. Marsh? That's, I'm conscious, I'm making a lot of contributions here, so I'll keep it brief. Um, the point you raise is right. The scheme's been in place for around ten years, and I, I think it's probably fair to say there's been no systematic evaluation of the scheme. That's deeply worrying. All the data we have to look at what happens to these businesses has been sat there for 10 years. So we have the data, as I said, to look at what are the wages paid by some of these businesses? Do they differ from businesses that don't receive the small business bonus scheme and so on? Now, what I would say to you is because the small business bonus scheme is a almost a universal benefit, you just it's just given to businesses based on the rateable value of the property, I'd actually be quite surprised if you saw things like um, wages rising or, or kind of other good things happening to the businesses because you don't put that in as a condition of, of, of the scheme. If you actually wanted to put something in to say, a condition of you receiving the small business bonus scheme will be you must pay your employees a living wage. It doesn't have to be anything traumatic in terms of form filling. You just say, tick, I, I do it, and have some kind of light touch way of doing it. But if you were to do that, then you could measure, did the wages of businesses in receipt of the scheme increase more quickly than those who didn't? Okay. Now, before I bring some of my colleagues in, and I'm holding back, there's lots of technical questions we think we should ask about the collection of data and the analysis of data. We will ask those, but I was just trying to take a few more generally from the scheme. Are there any additional comments before I bring some of my colleagues in? Okay, Graham Simpson. Yeah, just a quick question. I'm, I'm just wondering what, why this scheme has not been evaluated until now. I don't get that. It's been around for, what, 10 years? Why have we not monitored it? Just, there's not been any big call for an evaluation, and, it, and we haven't done one, but we are accepted the Barclay recommendation to do so. But you're handing out a, an awful lot of money. Are we, are we not uh, you know, even seeing if we're getting value for money? Well, surely, surely some work's been done. No? Yeah, of course. I think I just leave, I'm going to leave that hanging a bit longer in case someone wants to grapple with that. That, that comment. Monica, I will take you in. It's just that uh, Alexander Stewart's been quite patient. So, to Alexander, I'll first I'll take you in. It was on that point, specifically on that point? It, it was, yeah. Um, it was just to, to ask Marianne further to, to Graham uh, Simpson's question. Is this, is this typical for government policy of this scale and reach not to be evaluated sort of 10 years on, or is there a particular reason why this policy? hasn't been evaluated? Um, I lead on rates policy in the Scottish Government, so I can only really talk on that. I'm not an expert in any other policies of government um, where expenditure has been committed but not evaluated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is that a good practice in terms of the, the Green Book, um, the Treasury's Green Book? It sounds like evaluation is a pretty fundamental part of, of policy making. So. And I think that's why government very readily and very quickly accepted the Barclay recommendation to evaluate the scheme. Okay. And, and I suspect these are questions we're going to have to ask with the political leads on this as much as the if you like the 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 the, the, the officials as, as well but i think we will certainly be returning to that alexander stewart uh, thank you convener like others i'm i'm amazed staggered that we haven't had a review of this because we've heard already and the evidence shows that it's it's helped businesses thrive and survive 
It's been a lifeline to some organisations and, and groups, uh, uh, and there's no real evaluation to be with that. But my question is about business startups. Have we got anything with them? Because they are the <coughs> growth, or have been seen as the growth over the last decade, to try and ensure that the, the small business startup gets something going and it's supported within its first three years or five years. Uh, this kind of bonus scheme has, must have had a massive impact on that sector and that business organisation that's trying to be a small business startup. Um, I think we, you know, we know that Scotland has a lower startup rate than uh, the, the, than the rest than the UK average. We need to try and address that that problem. I think we need to understand that. Uh, not every business will immediately leap into into premises, um, but making um, more premises affordable and suitable for uh, for for businesses is going to be a benefit for uh, for, for for those starting up. Um, we need to. It, I think we need to recognise that it's a property-based uh, relief. So if you're not a property-based uh, system, but I I accept that. Um, from our point of view, uh, you, you know, a measurement in relation to the number of businesses started up could could be a, a part of a, any any review. And just reflecting on the um, on the calls for an, for an evaluation, you know, I think I would highlight that the ahead, you know, ahead of the last revaluation, you know, FSB was looking for the for the rate system to be examined in the in the round because we felt that there was many parts of it that were that could do with could do with reforms. Um, and we, we welcomed the Barclay review. Naturally um, we accepted its recommendation to, to look at the uh, to look at the small business bonus scheme, but we would also say that there are other parts of the rate system that could be looked at more urgently than necessarily the small business bonus. So following on from that it has been seen as a, an incentive for a business who's looking at property to try and then go into that process because it, it does give them that advantage uh, over other businesses that wouldn't necessarily fall into that category, uh, that are looking at a, at a specific premise. Yeah, well, if you are a, I don't know, if you manufacture... I don't know. You're a, you're a baker. You're a keen baker, and you're doing it out of your kitchen. And you uh, and, and you're saying you're making a decision about whether you're going to leave your kitchen and go and get a, a premises. And rates will be a factor, yeah. you know. Um, and I think that if we want more people to take the leap from the home in, into the premises, then we need to keep this policy. And and the whole the whole idea of reviewing it for them. What 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 benefits do you think? come out of that well what you know in our submission to, to to Barclay and in other bits of representation we've made to government what we're hoping is that a that the this the scheme the, 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 re, the value of the scheme is, is recognized that we can um, try and address some of the imperfections of the, of, of the scheme and mm -hmm. um, from our point of view we're aware of some uh, smaller businesses that occupy more expensive property who don't get help we would like to yep. see um, more more help for them in our representations to Barclay we made the suggestion that perhaps businesses could keep the relief as they grow so in uh, in mr. Doris's case at the point of revaluation and um, that particular business could have stayed in the in the premises in Finiston and kept the, the relief despite the the, the revaluation now that has slightly changed into the uh, into the business into the um, business accelerator re relief but I think the principle is the same is that we we would like to minimize any disincentive to, to growth um, as a consequence of the SBBS okay thank you Kevin. okay I'm just going to run through a few technical questions before the, the kind of broad themes that I know members want, want to explore um, so the Scottish annual business survey is one of the key ways that, that data is collected so that's the way data is collected. It, it's, it's an important survey. How should that be improved? Colleague Marina, who, who runs the, uh, the annual business survey. Okay, yeah. Maria. Thank Cameron. you. Um, so the annual business survey is a UK-wide survey and it's run by the Office for National Statistics. Um, the Scottish Government fund a boost to that to improve the results for Scotland. Um, and the survey itself contains information on, as Richard Marsh has said, turnover, purchases, um, costs to business and rates as well. Um, we don't, as part of our publication, our Scottish publication, Annual Business Survey, we don't publish the business rates figures um, because we have carried out some comparison work between what what we get from this survey against the actual rates income figures. And although at the headline level for Scotland, um, the figures are what we would expect given that the ABS um, isn't full economy, um, uh, excludes the financial sector and parts of the agriculture and public sector. 
at the headline level they are what we expect but then when we break it down by local authority area for example there are some stark differences between what that show rates income figures show for local authorities and what the ABS figures show for um, rates. So I mean, I'd like other witnesses to perhaps come and think about this as well so you could ask additional questions or you could further boost the sample size to get a more a much greater understanding of what's happening regionally and locally. So have either of those things been considered by government? We already um, boost the sample. Um, I really think what could be driving these differences, it could be down to um, modelling. So how the annual business survey works is the businesses are asked at the UK level for their company information. So they'll be asked for, so say it was a big supermarket, they would be asked, what, are you, the, what rates are you paying as the PLC? And they'll come back with that figure and then it's modelled out um, to see the shops. Um, so there could be issues to do with the modelling. So there's that to contend with um, as well as the sampling effects as well. Okay, anyone else get suggestions on how to, to improve this data or get a better understanding? Okay, we'll, we'll so move can on. Can I just make a, make a, just, just make a very quick point? Um, what I think Maureen has highlighted there is the annual business survey is a, is a standalone survey that can produce results for you now. And we've highlighted in our submission way it's actually fairly straightforward to get some results. They're imperfect. The other one that's not included in the annual business survey is, is things like car parks, which are in the rateable system that, that, that don't quite come into the system. But there's also other surveys like the Interdepartmental Business Register, which is a far broader survey. And instead of actually dragging data out, what you can do is link different sets of data together. So you can take data from the assessors, from local authorities, and link the sets of data together to actually have a bespoke database for you to, to do your evaluation on. That, that, that's in addition to everything that Marina's just outlined. Take your words for that, because that's it with my, my 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 knowledge and expertise. But I'd quite appreciate a government response on that, Ross Henderson. Uh, the kind of potential around that, we we have had a chat about that, and we think it's it's theoretically possible that you could uh, link the assessor's data to uh, the inter interdepartmental business register. Uh, at the moment, there's no like a unique identifier that lets us really easily do that. Um, we think there's some potential. Maybe we could use postcodes to try to link uh, data we've got on the interdepartmental business register. Uh, to uh, the uh, to the valuation role data that we have um, around using the annual business survey because the annual business survey isn't a it doesn't uh, survey the same businesses every single year so you wouldn't be able to see if a business uh, received relief in 2007 you wouldn't be able to follow the result of that business over time uh, so uh, in terms of linking it to the annual business survey I'm I'm not sure how much benefit would be there, but uh, this, in terms of the interdepartmental business register, uh, because that's a comprehensive list of uh, all yeah. the businesses in the UK, you could probably do some analysis maybe around business startups if they received, um, you know, the relief. You know, how did that affect employment or turnover in that business? And we think there's there's probably some potential around there, but it would probably require some sort of a large kind of manual exercise. You know, if that's uh, ourselves at Scottish Government does that, or independent contractor but it, it probably be quite a bit of work to do it but we do think it's it could potentially be possible see that's that. encouraging I, i've now learned something today that 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 that, that looks like a suggestion the scottish government's open to it uh, we were going to ask about issues with the valuation role and how that could be improved and how that fits into all those kind of things we've got some assessors here today so i'm just wondering are there any issues with the valuation role which creates challenges in assessing business rates and what 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 do the assessors maybe present think would need to be done to get more sophisticated in collecting the data for better analysis? Yes, uh, yes we've been silent up till now uh, because uh, essentially we are providers of the base data uh, on, on property assessment for taxation purposes uh, and, and really that is where our, our role starts and finishes, I'm afraid. So uh, the valuation role uh, consists of uh, the details of the 233,000 non-domestic properties in Scotland. So it's got an address, a unique property reference number, it's got the proprietor, tenant and occupier data, and it's got the rateable value and the effective date that that rateable value came into f effect. And really, that is it. So it's, uh, it's quite a, um, a, it's a very property-related um, uh, database. Uh, 
the issues, I suppose, around that is that if you're trying to compare that to business data, your business data, is, as has been referred to in earlier evidence, might relate to groups. Uh, or, you know, a business will have more than one property. And the, the challenge, I, I suppose, for those who wish to evaluate any, any, uh, any sort of uh, success or otherwise uh, in relation to businesses is to link property data with business data. Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question and then we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on. I want to make sure we've, we've, we've covered all, all, all the ground. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, the, I, I'm, I'm using terminology I'm not totally familiar with, but to what extent would the Office of National Statistics Virtual Microdata Lab, uh, a secure research service, provide secure access to sensitive data? I don't know if that links to what Mr Marsh was already talking about or not. Um, how, how could that be used for assessing non-domestic rate? Are we talking about the same thing, Mr Marsh, there? Yes, yes you are. Right, Just so a, we've covered it's that. It's a vehicle for accessing what we've talked about. So this with this inter interdepartmental connections. Okay, um, let's move on now. Uh, Graham Simpson. Um, okay, um, it was really a question for uh, Richard Marsh. Um, so, are you able to assess non-domestic rates using the information that's publicly available? Um, with the significant caveat to say, for what purpose are we evaluating this? What, what was this scheme trying to achieve? Once you set that out, um, I, I do evaluations and appraisals of public policy and for the private sector all the time. And you have to start with the, with the data that you have, with the best data that you have. What I put forward here today is we have not used the data as well as, as we could have. I think what was put forward there was to say we could use the annual business survey um, but that doesn't survey the same company year on year. If you're moving from to a, a longitudinal survey of tracking the same company over time, that's the Premier League evaluation. We're starting from nothing. So what I would say is, um, the, the point I think, Marion, Marion, you made to say there's been no call to evaluate it. Every penny the government spends should be evaluated at some point. The question is, yes. Given how much resource is going into a particular scheme or a policy, how often do you evaluate it and how much resource do you put in the evaluation? It could be a fairly light touch exercise. It could be something more in depth uh, as, as being described. We could have at any point over the last 10 years drawn some simple data from the business survey, some simple data from the assessors and drawn together to reach a broad conclusion as to what roughly is happening. So yes, you, you could do some evaluation now on the data that we have. Would it be perfect? No, no evaluation ever is. So you, you make the point that all the information is there, it's just nobody's collecting it or putting it in one place. How, how would that be done? Because it seems to me if you're going to evaluate a scheme, that's what you need to do. Um, I think as the convener said, I'm going to try and steer away from <laughs> any, any wider issues. It, it, it is, a focus on a practical one. You have here a scheme that's important and is well resourced, but as being Ian said there, that the assessor's job quite rightly starts and finishes with uh, the base data for, for commercial properties, essentially. The people responsible for delivering the scheme, effectively, are local authorities. The people responsible for setting the broad policy is the Scottish Government. There's very little connect between those three areas. The Barclay Review, and I have to say, I, I, was, I was, I think probably like most people, I was pleasantly surprised about what, how good the Barclay Review was. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised by the response by the Scottish Government, which I kind of think they, they deserve some credit for kind of taking on board most of, most of the suggestions. But one of the criticisms that was made was of the way the assessors put their data out. And I actually think the point Ian's say to say our position starts and finishes with this process that we're here to do, that's part of the problem. The assessor's data could be far better linked with the data that the local authorities hold and with the policies put forward every year by the government. But because you have three different parts of the policy delivering their processes and delivering them well and professionally, the broader picture is simply missed. 
in yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, just to develop that uh, uh, point uh, that Richard made, the, um, uh, I'm not sure about the criticism of uh, how we put the information out. The, uh, all the valuation roles for Scotland are available in a combined format uh, uh, through our joint web website that the assessors operate through the SAA. Uh, sa.gov.uk. So all the information is available uh, in terms of our assessments, our addresses and reference numbers and proprietor, tenant and occupier. That's available to uh, um, uh, private individuals and also to uh, corporate bodies uh, and uh, we also have a private area where we offer the facility for public institutions to download um, the whole valuation role for Scotland or parts of it and they can then analyse that how they see fit. Give. The information that I, I, I set out originally, the just the address, proprietor, tenant, and occupier. Mm -hmm. It also gives the um, the uh, rateable value and the effective date that comes into place, and also the description of the property as well. So it'll say whether it's a shop, a workshop, a warehouse, a museum, whatever. Okay, just just one more. Yep. Um, did, does anyone think there's um, any value in the in the government publishing a, a breakdown of total taxes? in this scheme? Total taxes. Total taxes, the total well, no. business rates paid? Yeah. I think, uh, I believe it's at least some of those statistics are, are, are available already. You know, um, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 there, are, there are some statistics. Just reflecting on what, what's been said here, I think one of the, key points for us in relation to Barclay and da data sharing more generally is that more effective data sharing between tax authorities could have a, a range of benefits for ratepayers as well, that you could see more accurate valuations. Um, in relation to statistics about the, the cost of this policy versus the total uh, the, the total rate, rates, rates pot, I think one thing I would be careful about is talking about the, the the notional cost of this policy. It's all, you know, the assumption is if you got rid of this policy, you would get every single penny back. There would be no ad additional administrative costs and we wouldn't replace it with anything at all. Um, and I think we have to bear, bear, bear in mind that, that, that a relief of this, key of this kind exists elsewhere, everywhere else in the UK. Okay. Thank you, Mr Simpson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I know Andy Whiteman wanted to follow up on some matters in relation to the assessors. Do you want to take that forward just now, Mr Whiteman? Um, yes, I mean, I had a broader range of questions. Oh, yes, go for them as well, absolutely. Well. Um, I mean, it seems to me that there's a distinction between evaluating um, a scheme of tax relief against the objectives that were set for it at the outset and evaluating a scheme as to the impact it's had, regardless of what the uh, uh, objectives were at the set. And Marianne, you said that the objectives of the scheme, why it was introduced, were that it was noted that smaller businesses paid a higher percentage of their turnover in property taxes. Yes. So presumably a formal evaluation of the scheme would simply look at whether that differential still exists or not, has it been evened out, and that would be the end of a formal evaluation against a policy intention. Or am I missing something that was set at the beginning as well? No, so I also mentioned it's about sustaining and growing small businesses as well. So the sustaining and the growing is the tricky part, yes. uh, in, in, in essence. I mean, the National Audit Office produced a report in 2014 called Tax Reliefs, which um, highlighted the quantum of tax reliefs provided by HMRC in, in that instance and was very critical of the lack of evaluation that had been done as to the benefits of these, some of which have been around for decades, in fact. So, in fact, it's nothing unusual that government doesn't evaluate tax reliefs. Um, I'm just, I've got a, a few questions, really. The, the first is, how should we do it? I mean, I was sitting in the Economy Committee yesterday um, talking to people from Scottish Development International about their recent evaluation of foreign divest in direct investment. And they were evaluating relatively small sums of money, quite comprehensively, and they did that through a tendering process with the private sector. And the private sector came in and evaluated and told them how much benefit it was to the Scottish economy uh, and all the rest of it. Should this be something, this review of the SBBS, that's done by, by tender, the private sector? Should we involve Audit Scotland in this? Um, or should it be done wholly internally by the Scottish Government? I, 
I don't think I've got any uh, strong views. I think the, the way that these sorts of exercises uh, are are usually done, in, in my experience, uh, is that it's uh, put out to put out to tender. Um, though we could, you know, if it, the the Scottish government, I w would imagine, would feed into that exercise. We could also have, you know, even before that, there could be a formal Scottish government consultation on the the methodology of any of any review. Um, I think there, there's a number of number of ways the government could go about it. Okay, that's that's helpful. Um, I'm also interested in evaluating it because it is a property tax, so taxes tax reliefs and taxes on property have impacts on properties. They have pr impacts on property values and rental uh, values. Um, so, I mean, one of my anecdotal stories is of a retail property in Musselburgh when the threshold for the 100% relief was raised to 15,000. It was an empty unit. Um, they just charged the new owner 15,000 uh, in, in rent. Um, because they were paying no rates, so they were they were no better off than they were before when they were paying ten thousand in rent and five thousand in rates. They were still paying fifteen thousand. It's just that all the fifteen thousand went to the landlord. So I'm just wondering whether we could include an evaluation of where the millions of pounds that the government's spending to give local authorities compensation for not receiving these these rates, where that's money's going, how much of it is just ending up in the pockets of landlords. Is that something we could do with the assessors' data? and with data from the Registers of Scotland, possibly? That's certainly uh, an area that I think is worth exploring. <clears throat> there has been research in the past uh, elsewhere, in, uh, for example, England, on the impact of enterprise zones, where uh, a, a rating relief of 100% was granted for five years. Uh, and uh, the research suggested that a significant amount of that benefit actually passed to the owner of the property rather than the occupier of the property. Uh, now, there's no research that I'm aware of in Scotland as to uh, whether that you know similar outcome is uh, uh, takes place, but that would help inform any debate on any evaluation of any relief scheme, in my view. Just, just to reflect on that point, I would highlight the many small businesses own the property in which they occupy, so they wouldn't be bound in that sort of uh, scenario. Um, I would also caution, you know, I've, I've, occasionally this this argument that landlords are uh, are. are are getting benefit from the small business bonus com comes up. We've not seen any evidence of that on, on, on any sort of wide scale. We would make the point that if the small business bonus was going to be abolished tomorrow, tomorrow I don't imagine that landlords would cut their uh, cut their rents in, rents in half. Um, that we need to be careful that we when, when we make those those particular arguments, um, and that any any evaluation needs to also recognise the difficult situation that smaller firms have when they're dealing with their their landlords. Um, that they're, they're, that 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 might be an interesting area for this this committee or another to look at is the position of, of smaller firms when they're dealing with large landlords. Okay, and just. Chip, I, I think I kind of agree with Stuart there. Uh, kind of, I, I think I'd be slightly sceptical about the benefits being passed to landlords. Um, but the broader point, we shouldn't just focus on the occupants of the commercial property. I, th I think the point in evaluation should look at the impact on landlords and how it's impacted on commercial property markets is, is, is a, it's absolutely vital. Yeah, uh, uh, just really coming back, uh, the, um, you know, my, my, my position as a lands valuation assessor is just that, I, you know, I assess property uh, for local taxation purposes. Uh, I am aware that this research has been carried out elsewhere. If the committee are interested in evaluating the impact of, of a particular relief scheme, then that might be an area that they wish to, uh, you know, follow. Uh, I, the uh, point that Stuart made about many small businesses are owner-occupied is, is very true. Uh, but, of course, you've got to remember that at each revaluation for non-domestic rating purposes, we are assessing the annual value of all properties, whether they're owner-occupied or not. So if, for example, uh, SBBS does uh, mean that um, the benefits of, of some or all of that relief do pass to the landlord by, in way of higher rents, if that is the case, then at the next revaluation, those higher rents will inform the assessors who determine the rateable values. So there is possibly a cycle of cause and effect here uh, that you know, might be worth exploring. Okay, that, that's helpful. And as I understand it, the valuation rule also includes 
whether the ratepayer is the occupier or the landlord. That's narrated in the Yes, the rule. proprietor tenant so we know all that information. information is available, yes. Yeah. Uh, just some technical questions on the rule. Um, I mean, you mentioned it's available, and it is available online, and I've analysed it. In fact, you've been very helpful in sending me some of the raw data to do analysis on um, short-term lets and non-domestic rates. I'm just wondering if there's uh, any uh, reason why it just can't be made available as a block download for anyone to look at, because it seems to me that when we're when evaluating public policy on things like tax reliefs, as many people analysing the data as possible is a no bad thing. Yes, we do. We do uh, provide um, bulk download facilities to uh, to bodies who approach us uh, on that. I, I'm just I'm, I'm just talking about make it available on the website for any citizen to download it. Right. Uh, well, I think we do actually. Um, you've. You've, you've caught me at a point here where the, we do have selective um, download procedures uh, available to the public. So I'm not quite sure precisely uh, today how much information, whether there's any limitation on that. We've obviously got, it's a quarter million records, so there might be, you know, capacity issues as well on that. So I don't know where... It's, um, to add to that? Uh, well, really just to say that it is available... Um, I should qualify this, that we have been researching some of the data protection issues associated around the valuation role. However, the, the current position is that we will make the valuation role available for minimal cost, whatever it costs to provide a, a CD or whatever data format it is available. There isn't, a, for the general public, a general download facility within the, within the website, although there is, are facilities of that sort available to government users, etc. Okay, Mr. Marsh, did you want Ms. Marsh to add something? Yeah. Th th this yeah. is the point I was making about, about the data. The portal that the assessors has, is, is the, the Scottish Assessors Association, the, the portal, it's very good. And if you're involved in the assessing of commercial property, it's a great place for you to go. But there are real limits in how you can analyse that database. And it, 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 it's based around the address, the addresses of the property. That not, might not be the way you want to start. Someone might want to say, well, my valuation of my pub in Fife, I want to know how do I stack up against pubs in Glasgow or somewhere in the Highlands. And then I might want to know something about the ownership. Am I getting a fair deal? I'm only saying that because these are the kind of questions that occur to me and the kind of some of the limitations. Now, but as you said, it's the metadata sat behind it. All of it is available. And anyone, the, right, anyone can download it tomorrow, but they'd have to go in section by section, address by address. There shouldn't be any reason why well, couldn't click a button and get the metadata and download the whole thing? Throw it out to some university's hackathon. The kids seem to love playing around with this kind of data. But the real value comes when you have as many people as possible crawling over the data and drawing out interesting messages. And that might have nothing to do with commercial properties. It could be something actually no one around this table has actually thought of yet. But that, that's when the real value comes in. And, and possibly the, these... The bright young things that go to these hacking events, they, they come up with really good ways of presenting the data in, in, a, in a fresh way that's kind of quite visual and, and stimulating. Mr Milton, yes? Yeah. Uh, we, we do already have uh, a, a download facility so you can download all the details of all the pubs or all the shops or whatever it is in a particular locality. That's, that's available already. Uh, but it's, it's still restricted to the data that the law requires us uh, or, or mandates us to publish, which is the description of the property the address, proprietor, site, occupier, and rateable value. So that is already available. Uh, the, um, but we are also working on ways of actually widening access. But again, it's a resource. And there are also data protection issues. Um, for example, once you get into the sole trader position, you're in a personal data situation. So, you know, we're working with, uh, we've certainly been working with the Information Commissioner uh, to, uh, and also advisors on how much data we can make available. Because in my view, uh, our and, uh, view of the association, the more data that we have that's available, the better. Just, just a, a small point in relation to this, you know, the assessor's data will show you how many uh, properties could notionally apply for the small business bonus, but will not have the data which is held by the local authority, about the number of properties. So the set, for any sort of meaningful analysis of the kind that were discussed, you would have to have multiple data sets uh, c combined. Um, and I think that has been a, 
um, from from a ratepayer's point of view, that has been a bit of a of a, of a frustration. The the, the 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 gap, as Mr. Marsh puts it, between uh, the the various policies, uh, the various parts of government involved in rates policy. Okay, and just finally, yes, I'm aware that other members want to come in. Oh, sorry, oh, Mr. Henderson, you need to be more clear sorry, than you want, uh, you want to speak. <laughs> just a, a small point, just in the terms of the transparency of data. Um, as uh, convener will know that we had committed to publish uh, details of relief recipients as part of the Barclay review, and that will be uh, in terms of kind of providing details of more transparency around uh, the data on reliefs provided to ratepayers. Uh, that will be something that we'll publish. So, uh, and as you know, forthcoming. So, and that was going to be my final point. I mean, I I, I noted that. And is it my understanding as well that it's intended that information then be displayed on the roll? No, it probably, the evaluation roll is a sort of a, a set statute mm. uh, requirement. Relief isn't part of that. You'd need to change the law if you wanted to do that. If you wanted to do it relatively quickly, which I think the Scottish, it's fair to say the Scottish Government wants to implement Barclay quickly, it would not link to the valuation rule. It would be a separate entry. But, but there is, a, there is a, a unique identifier for each property which would allow a linkage to be done. Well, that's what I was going to say, because when you publish this data, it'll have that you can ident identify. If anyone's got the valuation rule, they can link it up. Yeah, we're not sure exactly how the format is, but certainly we would envisage that there should hopefully be a linkage across with the valuation rule data. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, uh, Jerry Gorath. Good morning to the panel. Um, Stuart McKinnon, in terms of uh, the FSB's own research, uh, you alluded to in your opening remarks that nearly 20% of your members said that if the scheme was cancelled, they would uh, cancel any planned investment. And on the same data set, 18.3% would amend plans for growth, which is obviously quite concerning in the, in the context of town centres. Um, that survey was conducted in August, September 2016 with 960 responses. Could you just talk us through the process for gathering that data, how you, you gather it with your members? Is it done online? Do you go door to door? How is it done? So as you know, FSB uh, membership organisation, 17,000 or so members in Scotland. Um, we have uh, perhaps about two thirds of, uh, of our members we have uh, email addresses for, for. We invite them to take part in surveys on any number of issues for that particular survey. We invited uh, our, our members that uh, occupied properties to give us some views on uh, on their overheads, looking at the small business bonus specifically. Um, that particular uh, data set went to inform our submission to uh, to, to Barclay. Yep. Um, and we also followed that up with some um, qualitative work with individual business owners, asking them um, about what would happen if it was cancelled. Um, you know, and, and in those sorts of d discussions, our members often talk about the very tight margins that they're uh, that, 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 that they're on. So, while average savings of between two between two and seven thousand uh, pounds that may not seem a, a, a lot um, to to some people, it can really be the difference between uh, continuing in business and, and closing down. Um, I think you know what you have to remember is for a business to make. Uh, Two thousand pounds, they could have to turn over up to, to six or seven thousand pounds, you know. And, and in these sort of strained economic times with limited um, household spending, that would be a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, um, FSB's carried out a bit of research in terms of how bank closures are affecting town centres. And I know personally uh, from some one of the towns in particular that I represent, that bank closures had a really detrimental impact on on the town itself. And I know that you've made a recommendation to the UK government earlier this year to stop communities being left without a banking service in your submission. Uh, to the work that's ongoing in the Commons at the moment. But with regard to your recommendations, you talk about the review needing to look at ways to ensure that all sorts of smaller operators get proportional help. But interestingly, you also point to looking at how it can support local places. So do you think that a review needs to look at the local economic conditions in an area? So for example, does an area suffer from um, adverse rates of deprivation? Uh, what about child poverty levels? Um, what about new towns? Do we need to target then any appraisal of the scheme as it currently stands and look at how it is actually helping to drive inclusive economic growth? I, you know, the, the, you, the, we could absolutely take a place-based approach. We could. Yep. What we have to recognise is that because it's a relief on lower value properties, areas that are poorer will have more lower value properties and will get disproportionate help already. Mm -hmm. um, 
But if you were going to, you know, go further and look at ways of uh, injecting new life into high streets and town centres that have perhaps lost a bank branch or lost a, another local amenity, you could look at either changing the small business bonus or topping up the, the, the small business bonus. I know that in some of the follow-up work from Barclay, they're looking at additional measures that could help you know, augment the, the effectiveness of the small business bonus to try and address uh, town centre and high street issues. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, could we look at problem units in town centres and say, right, in these exceptional circumstances, we will, you know, give a rate relief for this empty bank branch so yeah. that a local business or a local group of businesses could take it over and run a business incubator, you, you know. Um, could we, uh, could we, I don't know, if we're going to build uh, this th this local uh, amenity, let's do it. And I, I suppose, in I think if we talk about town centres, one of the key issues which uh, public bodies point to in relation to relocating services in town centres is that they argue about business rates too. So could we ensure that our business rates policy encourages more of our public bodies and people like banks, for example, to continue to have a presence in our, in our local communities? Mm -hmm. Can I just ask a final point on that? And this is a very specific local point with regard to how the policy works in new towns, whereby you, you might have, as I, I do in Glenrothes, a private company owns the, the new town itself. Um, has the FSB carried out any research with regard to how new towns specifically can be supported in terms of driving that growth and getting the start-ups that Alexander Stewart alluded to? I, or I is it something you might do in I, the future? I, I, I'll, I'll see what we have in terms of feedback from members in new towns yep. and see if there's any data uh, specifically. I, I think that, you know, the... Of course, this isn't, this isn't just a relief for shops and it's not just a relief for high streets, yeah. offices and all sorts of mm -hmm. other properties. And we, we, can't, we can't just get fixated on, on the high street. But the high street's so important mm -hmm. that we, whenever there is an empty unit, we must, pull, you know, we must st stretch every city to make sure it's filled. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Monica Lennon. Yeah, if, hi, if we can stick with, um, I suppose, town centres. I mean, I suppose over the period of, of um, this policy, um, you've, had a lot of surveys with, with your members, 17,000. Are you getting a sense that in that period where members have been recipients of small business bonus scheme, are they more or, or less optimistic about, about the vibrancy of their high street or town centre? Are you getting that kind of well, feedback you in your survey work? You know, in our in, in our submission, we highlight you know that we can't look at this policy in isolation. You know, the world is changing. We see the rise of the digital economy. We see the you know a range of challenges. You know, bank branch closures, uh, the a range of large and public and private bodies pulling out of our town centres and our high streets, mm -hmm. and s s independent businesses can't win the the fight for the high street on their own. Um, they they need the the support of. Uh, big organisations, they need uh, efforts like like the small business bonus to make uh, units in our town centres more attractive in comparison to uh, staying at home or, or, or a warehouse on the on the edge of town. I think that it's you know it's not it's not a silver bullet for for town centres and high streets um, and not every property in a in a town centre or a, or a local high street will get the small business bonus but it is a it is a tool in our in our in our armory um, and that many of our of our retail members uh, ha have spoken about how important it is especially when they've got uh, when they when they face uh, enhanced competition for for let's say on online businesses. And I think what's been quite encouraging is that when Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary, came to committee, I think he's quite open to, I suppose, the, the remit and, and the, the breadth of analysis. But there's been a bit of, we've touched on maybe other policies that affect small businesses and town centres. So I'm mindful that the Scottish Government has a policy of town centres first. Is there anything that the panel is aware of um, in terms of how um, tax policy um is sits within that that overarching policy of promoting town centres and have you get any sense of if local government and other public bodies are, are playing their part i suppose what i'm saying is we have a, a policy of town centres first but how do we actually drive that sure oh, if, 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 I, if i may um the you know the scottish government's town centre review you know, talked about many levers the, the Scottish government and other public bodies had to turn turn around our our town centres or our high streets. One element of that was was business rates. Um, I think that you know, d disappointingly, we we see 
you know, we still see a lot of public bodies not investing as we might like to, uh, both reserves and devolved in, in town centres and, uh, and high streets. Um, you know, if we're going to turn around our town centres and high streets, we need to make them affordable, we need to make them accessible, we need to make them clean, we need to make them safe, uh, and that requires an awful lot of work. Um, I think that the you know rate, rates policy in isolation um, is not is not going to turn places as well. But conversely, it's a it's a a, a, a sympathetic rates policy is a, is a necessary but not sufficient condition to turning around our, our town centres and, and high streets. Mm -hmm. One of the of some of the themes that have been raised with me in my past as a local councillor and, and now as an MSP is just for these very small businesses where you've maybe got one or two people it's about having the capacity to to train staff um, to engage in social media to be involved in, in marketing so I know in, in many towns across Scotland um, business improvement districts have been seen as a, a vehicle so Hamilton where, where I'm based that's a that's a bid town from your survey work with members are you able to to look to see any um, sort of synergy between the benefits derived from small business bonus scheme where um, your members are also part of a bid area? Um, yes. So you will still contribute to the bid even yeah. if you pay the small business bonus. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know we broadly support bids where they're business led um, and where it's the businesses making the decision about where the uh, where the where the money spent. Um, I think that you know bids have an important role in uh, in town centre and high street areas. It, obviously, they don't necessarily need to be geographic. They could be they could be set. Uh, you could set up a sectoral bid. bid. Um, I think that we need to be um, uh, you know you know the relationship between bid functions and local government functions you get into a bit of a, a grey area there and i suppose that's where some of our members have 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 voiced concerns but certainly um i think that you know you know you could you could make the argument that uh, a bit bids are more attractive for smaller firms if they are uh, if they're getting this this relief because ultimately paying the bid levy is more affordable okay just the last point for now. So I think FSB has seventeen thousand members. Um, there must be about another eighty-seven thousand or so um, businesses, small businesses who benefit from um, the small business bonus scheme. Um, so we've got an indication of of your members. Is there anything the panel can say about non-FSB members? Have we get any idea um, of their views on it? And would we? perhaps see different results and feedback if we were able to capture the views of everyone who um, is a recipient of the scheme? Can I put into from the government care to address Anecdotally, that? Um, Scottish Grocers Federation, for example, were recently in touch because they were interested in the evaluation. They have a lot of smaller members too. Obviously, we engage with the bigger business organisations as well as the smaller ones to get their views and obviously their membership can be quite broad and quite wide. Also, because even though um, FSB has seven, seven, 17,000 sorry members, some of those may have several properties as well. So some of the, the way this, the small business bonus scheme works, someone with maybe three or four properties could be getting a small business bonus on that. So the 17,000, although I know some of those might not have property, could represent more proper, a disproportionate number of properties as well. Um, but we don't, it's the, different, the difficulty is the link between properties and, and business as well, um, which we've, we've talked about at length already. Andy Whiteman, did you want to come on the back of some of that? Yes, just a few <coughs> supplementaries on that. Um, your survey that you based, Stuart McKinnon, the FSB for the Barclay Review uh, was 960 respondents. So out of our membership of 17,000, that's about 5%. Yes. Um, did you did you weight that? Or was that just anybody who wanted to could reply to it? Or did you um, try and weight it for geography, type of business? No, we didn't weight that particular uh, survey or... Uh, our we wanted a good response rate, so we didn't we didn't wait it on that on that occasion. Though I can provide the uh, the full survey data to the panel if the if that would be if that would be useful. Uh, it may be of interest. I'm sure that would be of interest to the <laughs> review of the small so, business bonus yeah. scheme. Certainly, because my concern obviously would be if you take 960, you take a five percent return. That may not reflect the broad views of the small business bonus scheme. That may just reflect a disproportionately people in Glasgow or people with shops or whatever. Uh, uh, abso you, no, uh, absolutely. So there there are uh, 
three hundred and sixty odd thousand businesses in in Scotland, uh, a hundred thousand recipients of the small business bonus scheme, um, are um, as as Marianne points out, only a share of them will be will be our members. I think that if you were going to do an evaluation, um, you would get as many businesses as possible. I would highlight that uh, the FSB has more me business members than any of the other business membership groups and that regularly we see data sets presented that are far smaller than than that so um i think that a sample size of, of 900 plus is uh, is a is a reasonable one in, in that particular circumstance okay thank you okay uh, david toms okay yep, no, um I've got a couple of matters i want to follow up on but before i ask them any other questions from committee members just now yeah, just um, briefly, thanks, convener. Um, I think one of the reasons um, Barclay Review gave for saying that there should be a review of um, SBBS was that um, there's some misuse of the scheme as apparent. Is anyone able to um, say a bit more about that, how widespread it is, and in what way is, is it misused? I'm, I'm to the Review. So I can Excellent. explain the, the rationale. The, the, one of the things, one of the re they made a recommendation on a particular one around self-catering properties, that there's an abuse there if... For example, if I have a second home, I may claim that it is a self-catering property to avoid payment of council tax, get it put onto the non-domestic rates rule um, by, with the assessors, and then claim small business bonus. So Barclay suggested a particular reform, which the Scottish Government has accepted, to close off that potential loophole. Uh, they also, Barclay made a separate recommendation about um, empty property relief, whereby if I have a small empty property, I would tend to claim small business bonus and not pay rates, whereas a neighbouring property that was larger and out with the small business bonus would be paying a greater proportion because it would only qualify for empty property relief. So again, Barclay made a recommendation that properties that are under a certain threshold shouldn't, and empty should not be able to claim small business bonus. Well, and I'm sure there are other loopholes that possibly other people may wish to talk about. Just, Mr. Milton, just before you come in on that, because that that was really helpful, Monica. That's exactly what I was going to ask about. So, I would contend that there might be businesses out there um, where you 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 own the property, you're getting ten percent rates relief on empty properties. So you open a business, but you're not really trading. You really are just doing it as a sleight of hand to get the small business bonus. Is that that that's that's a, a legal abuse of the system, but it would still be an abuse of the system. Is is that a situation that anyone would recognise, or anyone would 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 be keen to have either assessors, local authorities, or government interrogate, Mr. Milton? The yes, I I think this um, this. Abuse might be a strong term to use. Uh, I think there may be some restructuring of, of some business operations to benefit from um, small business bonus scheme, uh, but I don't have any uh, quantitative data on this. But uh, assessors have experienced uh, situations where uh, a single business entity has, dis with uh, maybe uh, a large property, has uh, subdivided and restructured into several smaller separate entities uh, that are separate rateable occupiers and therefore what was a large assessment of say um, some warehouse at £40,000 RV rateable value would end up in, uh, in several smaller units with lower values that would then possibly benefit from relief uh, through small business bonus scheme. There is some uh, uh, acknowledgement that that has happened but we, don't, we can't quantify that in terms of numbers. Okay, perhaps we should have rephrased that to gaming the system rather than than abuse. But I've I've heard anecdotal information. Again, if you're not collecting the data a certain way, it only ever can be anecdotal information that that you receive in in, in relation to that. Uh, I'm also just uh, wondering about uh, the thresholds in relation to uh, the current rates relief system. I was just having a quick look there. And it was much more tapered and graduated. I was looking back in 2014, what was the rates relief in 2014? And it was up to £10,000 for rateable value. It was 100% relief. And then up to £12,000, it was 50%. Up to £18,000, it's 25%. It's currently 100% up to 15 and 25% up to 18 That's much more of a cliff edge, if you like. I'm just wondering if anyone's given consideration or done an analysis 
of those thresholds and the taperings of the system and how that does or doesn't distort um, the small business bonus uh, scheme and how, how it's meant to, to work in practice and supporting the, you know, uh, sustaining and growing businesses, you know, surviving and thriving. Has there any consideration been given to why it's now everything or 25% or nothing rather a more graduated approach as it used to be by the Scottish Government? In designing any scheme, any tax relief, any benefit, you have to balance affordability with helping the maximum number of recipients. So that's one of the reasons why the 50% band of relief um, disappeared. Elsewhere in the UK, there are different variants of the scheme. For example, in England, there is a taper. So you could get anywhere from 100 to 0% relief. You get 56 or 47. But the, the, I suppose the payoff is that their scheme, the 100% relief, ends at a rateable value of £12,000. So, so there's various models that could, that could be in place for the scheme. Um, and obviously, as part of an evaluation, we would be open to considering any recommendations made. What about uh, uh, Mr McKinnon? I'm just wondering, or even the assessors, because if you're assessing a property, it can't possibly be an exact science. So, you know, it's £15,020. I bet it's not. I bet it's either 15000 or it's 15 and a half because when you get to those grey areas and margins, there's a significant difference in... Uh, the benefits to to the property or the property owner or business that you're assessing. So w would tapering be more helpful either to small businesses or to the assessors and having a more finesse system? You know, the, the, we would have to go and do some research with our members about, you know, a, a preferable system. You know, intuitively, a t tapering sounds like a, like a sensible uh, idea, you know, and um, maybe tapering upwards from our current thresholds rather than tapering you know below the below the current thresholds one 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 key point that i would i would make though is that we need to get the ad, the administration of the system right and working you know when the scottish government introduced measures to try and cushion the um the, the revaluation last year, local authorities across the country had a huge, a huge amount of difficulty implementing those those measures, primarily because of their relationship with their IT supplier. And um, so it could we can invent the the most perfect tapering, the the, the you know uh, make all sorts of tweaks to the system. But if we don't have the ca capacity to implement them, then it's it's going to be a it's going to be a paper exercise. Okay, Mr. Milton, Mr. Kip, would any? I'll, I'll take you in a second, Mr. Marsh. Absolutely. Mr. Bob, you don't have to comment on it. I'm just wondering no, if you do have any um, comments on it. I would say that the convener is, is quite correct. That there is a, a very sharp focus at the thresholds, uh, and particularly assessors see that regularly in uh, appeal situations where um, there is a, a, a focus on appeals at that threshold and clearly a, an ambition to have values below the threshold. The, the cliff edge nature of the, the relief is one that we do see uh, on a regular basis from the ratepayers that we speak to and there is clearly a, a fairly significant difference between receiving 100% relief if your value is just below the threshold or a, a rates bill which you would uh, receive if you're just above above the threshold. Um, the other aspect that flows from this is that rate payers below the threshold do tend to kind of lose sight if you like of the, the rating system um, and perhaps not appreciate the, the impact of thresholds and we do mm -hmm. meet with rate payers who were perhaps below the threshold at the previous revaluation are now above the threshold and did not appreciate the impact of that that cliff edge nature of the of the scheme. So yes, we do these, see these effects in the people that we meet on a daily basis. Appreciate you putting that in the public record, Mr. Marsh. My apologies. Do you want to add anything? Just, just, just very, very briefly. The point that was made earlier by some of the some of the members was anything we do on this policy has to take into account there are much wider issues for town centres. Um, the small business bonus scheme, its ability to make a, a dent in that is pretty limited against some of the stuff that's going on. But I was quite caught by what was said earlier with, with regards to the point you're making now. There, there was, I'm not sure if I caught this correctly, but um, there, was, there was a reference to say the assessors, um, I'm not, not trying to be too critical <laughs> of, of, of what you do, but the assessors have a mandate, and we're talking about we need more legislation to, to, to make people put stuff out into the public domain. And when you do the work um, to look at the rates and we're publishing recipients, it'll have a unique property reference number which is also on the assessor's role. My head just spins with this, only, only in Scotland. It, 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 it's, it's, if we were sat around a table and this were a, a, a limited company, we've got these guys that have this fantastic set of data with a property reference number, 
you're going to be publishing recipients with a property reference number. People have a legal obligation to produce a certain type of data in a certain way, but could we not just say, but the biggest benefit to helping improve public policy is published in quite a different way, and for those data sets to be linked up? Just, I'm, I'm going to just, because there's going to be, if you get a second point to make, I'm absolutely going to let you make it, but I just want for clarity, is that going back to Mr Whiteman's line of questioning about having all the information out there in a systematic way, because we were going to just ask before we, we wrapped up questioning here, is if all that information is already available and is not breaking data protection rules, how does disaggregating that information into more localised, usable, bite-sized chunks how, how can that compromise data protection? So uh, uh, is it that area you were kind of focusing on about that release of information, Mr Whiteman's line of questioning? Yeah, it, it absolutely is. The data, I think, could be released. And I think yeah, there is very good work done by the assessors, so I don't want to try and paint, 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 paint too... No, too we, we should let them answer, but, but is it, is it that but, area? Because we, we should let them answer if it is that area. I just wanted to make sure... Right, so we'll let, I will let you back in, but it is that specific area. So, so what are the barriers? And let you just if the information is out there already, it's all publicly available, but it's not user friendly, it's not disaggregated, but it's technically all out there. And Mr. Whiteman was asking the question, and maybe data protection and protocols was a was a barrier to release. Well, if it's already out there, where's the barriers? I suppose. Uh, uh, convener, the the situation is at present that uh, we don't have the facility to do a bulk download on demand. Uh, we can, you know. People can download data, but at, uh, at present, it, there are limitations on that. And I think we need to do some maybe some more development. And of course, there's always a resource issue on that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, the reference number, all our properties bear the, what is um, the corporate address gazetteers code. Now, local authorities are responsible for maintaining um, the sort of master list of addresses for properties throughout Scotland. And that includes a corporate address gazetteer reference number. And that number is also carried on our database and should be carried on other uh, public databases. So there should be reasonable read across um, on that. It may be that there's still a little bit of research or rather resource required to open, up the, uh, open it up to complete download facilities regardless. But uh, I don't think there's any, any real barrier to doing that. So it's, it's, a, it's a technical one, it's a technical resource one rather than a... You're restricted. You're not restricted by legislation or data protection. You're restricted by the technology that's there, the system that's there, and the resources to to interrogate that in a way that we could get the information the way Mr. Whiteman was was referring to. Is that a reasonable? Yes. Right. For the valuation role data that we are obliged to publish. Yes. Okay, Mr. Marsh. I apologise. Uh, you wanted to make an additional point there. Very, very. But my point was, if it was a limited company and you were in charge of the board, you'd be saying get together and produce that database next week. But the point about kind of the, 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 the cliff edge and the valuations why we have £12,000, £15,000, it's because they're nice round numbers. Because the system is disparate, we produced, a, we produced a chart at the back of our submission, just on the very basic annual business survey data, showing the burden of business rates is higher for smaller companies in the hospitality sector. The medium-sized companies are squeezed a little bit, but, but no one's got a joined-up set of data to say when we set the thresholds at the following levels, this is what it did to the burden to businesses based on their profitability, their turnover, and the business characteristics. Those databases are separate from one another because the system is administrated by three separate entities. Okay. Um it was your line of question, Mr. Whiteman. My apologies. Would you like to come and add something? Uh, it was just a couple of slightly different yes, points. Yes. Um, uh, well, well, just just on that point, Mr. Marsh, I I I I am struck by that. I think when we set income tax rates and things, we we look at who benefits and and, and all the rest of it. I just wondered on the on the broader point of the evaluation, which is what, what we're looking at today and how to do it. I noted, I think that Northern Ireland has evaluated its small business rate scheme. It's not called exactly the same. Um, what other evaluations have been done specifically of tax relief systems, and it needn't be non-domestic rates, it could be other tax relief systems, in the United Kingdom that we could learn from in terms of how to do it that represent best practice? Does it, is anyone aware of any? 
I, I made reference to an HMRC study on into enterprise zones. Uh, yes. I could provide the committee with a reference for that. That that would be helpful. Um, the other point I was just going to note, of course, and this is not so much to do with the evaluation, although maybe it is, is that we've been talking about thresholds um, for reliefs. Obviously, another way of doing that is to get rid of all reliefs, uh, get rid of all reliefs, and just change the rate setting, the rate, the rate itself, instead of being a flat rate of forty-eight point six pence or whatever it is now, um, have it like we have income tax. 10 pence for the first 10,000 of rateable value, 20 pence for the next 10, or whatever. I mean, those are tax design issues. Do you think tax design issues should be included in an evaluation? Or do you think the, the, the evaluation should strictly look at why did we set this up and have it, has it achieved the um, ambitions we set for it? Mr McKinnon. You know... In our in our submission to Barclay, one of the ideas that we, we suggested was, you know, uh, an idea like a tax threshold for for a business. So any business, the, the first X thousand of their RV would be uh, would would be rates rates free, and then everything above that. That as an as a concept was discounted by by Barclay. I think if we're going to try and get on, then we have to accept that we're probably going to have to try and narrowly look at. Uh, the, the the small business bonus as it as it is, and not look at it absolutely uh, absolutely um, every you know opportunity to change the tax system into into another sort of tax system. Um, I think that we would um, in in relation to all of the various you know I I don't think certainly I've got no, heard no indication from the government from the Scottish government that they're up for a a, ver much, a large variety of poundages. So um, it will be up to the Scottish government to decide what is in scope when they when they develop this this particular review. Mister Mister Henderson, on that, um, actually part of uh, the Barclay review we did it was considered, uh, or in Annex C um, there was uh, some modelling done on kind of setting marginal rates of uh, tax within uh, business rates. But obviously, I mean the Barclay review didn't recommend, didn't make that as a recommendation. Um, so I guess that would be. Uh, the position on that. So. Uh, okay. Just, just getting back to the question of, of data, um, my understanding was that the I think the Scottish government announced the creation of a thing called the Scottish Land Information System that Registers of Scotland is going to do. It's launched something. It's very minimal, but that was, I think, conceived to try and link up planning data, um, land use restrictions, ownership, occupation, valuation, etc. Is that the kind of system, Richard Marsh, that you were alluding to, um, a set of joined up data that would allow more sophisticated analysis of properties in this instance um, and, the, and, and, and businesses? I'm not uh, hugely familiar with the, the source you've said, but, but in principle, yes, that is, that is what I'm alluding to. Okay. Okay, Mr. Moulton, do you want yes, to just the, uh, our, our, uh, the, our website senior responsible officer has been uh, engaged with, um, I think there was a project called Unify, uh, and I, I forget all the various acronyms, but uh, we have been at the table, and we, we wish to continue to be at the table. We, we know that we're guardians of very valuable data, and uh, uh, our position is that if that data can be used uh, legally and effectively, then uh, you know, the public purse has paid for it to be produced, so uh, there should be benefit, uh, providing that we, we can tick all the legal boxes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can I just check before we, we, we close up uh, the session here, uh, the data that you have, do, do, does it allow the assessors to, to, to ensure themselves that someone's not uh, inappropriate claiming small business bonus because the aggregated value of their, their businesses or properties takes them above that threshold? Is there, is there, is there a kind of cross-check done on, on applications to make sure that's not the case? Uh, well, that you know, that would be the responsibility. I, I don't want to say <laughs> to do a, a buck passing sort of answer, but I'm afraid that would be the responsible for the levying authority, who actually does award the uh, relief. Uh, the relief is granted on application, and it would up to the directors of finance of the of the 32 local uh -huh. authorities. Uh, I'm not f familiar with exactly what arrangements they have uh -huh. to. Uh, uh, make sure fraud doesn't no, take I think, place. I think government officials are going to come in on that, but can I just check before I, I pass to Mr Henderson, do you, do you have the data that would allow you to cross-check that or allow someone else to cross-check that? Does the data exist to let you do that? I think the data... 
the assessment role which the levying authority uses, which is almost a, which is a mirror of the valuation role, but okay. it will have the actual responsible person for paying of rates, and that can sometimes be slightly different from the occupier data that we have, just because for some reason that there could be a difference between the occupier and whoever is being assessed for the rates. So the assessment roles are the, are the source, and I believe that Barclay made recommendations about uh, information on reliefs being available, and maybe assessment roles might be published. So uh, you know, I think that's that's the direction of travel to avoid fraud. Yeah, I, I, I would I would support that, Mr. Henderson. Yeah, just to answer your question around uh, whether the built like so we have a data set of all the individual properties in Scotland and how much relief is awarded to each individual property. In relation to your question around, uh, can you check if a business uh, a business has a combined value over £15,000? Um, what happens is the, the valuation world doesn't really have a consistent set of business uh, names. There's uh, It varies across uh, different local authorities, the kind of naming conventions given to different businesses. So um, we'll, we'll know that you know Morrison's, for example, uses a different kind of name across different local authorities, but you can uh, use various kind of methods of checks to look into whether a business is, uh, you know, large is claiming small business bonus scheme uh, where it shouldn't be. So that's that's something we could ultimately do. Yeah, mm. I, I'm raising it. I'm not raising it as an issue. I'm just raising it to find out if it is an issue. Is that there's any concern in relation to that, or am I just I'm, I'm, have I got that wrong? The, you know, the, there is a there is an issue with n not just the small business bonus, but generally there's no. Scotland-wide Scotland -wide database of ownership and uh, or ownership of property, which causes all sorts of problems in the allocation of uh, of relief, as I understand it, not just the small business bonus. And I, and I think that, you know, we were talking about high street and, and town centre issues earlier, um, you know, who owns that ghastly uh, falling down property in our high street is as much of a concern to many small businesses, and at present, many local authorities simply don't simply don't know, and that's a, that's a related problem to the to the issues we're talking about today. Okay, um, so just before we we, we, we end the session, I, I'll, I'll give people the opportunity because obviously the Scottish Government review is going to happen. Uh, any thoughts? Last opportunity, what the remit of that should be what stakeholders should be actively involved in that review and what the timing of that should be. So there's three separate things. Um, absolutely, Scottish Government officials might wish to comment on that, but I also appreciate that might be a decision that's made by a uh, government, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary, rather than yourselves, but happy for you to comment on that if you wish. But uh, are other witnesses, any, any comments in relation to that, just before we, we finish this evidence session? Go on then. Um, I would... Um you know, the, the points that I make is that we want any review to be a, to focus on the best ways to support Scottish small businesses, the best way to make sure that they are they're treated rate fairly by the by the rate system. Um, in terms of, of timing, we I would make a, a, an argument that there are more uh, urgent uh, elements of the rate system that need to be addressed before we look at the small business bonus. We talked today about about some of them. Um, we would suggest that the timescales which Barclay initially recommended would be would be sensible. Okay. Any other comments on that? No, uh, well, no and yes. Mr. Milton. <laughs> if I may, just... No that, comments, uh, but yes, I'll say something anyway. <laughs> okay. if, if I may, just that the SAA is willing to work with partners to uh, assist as, as they can. OK, thank you, Mr. Milton. Mr. Marsh? Very briefly, it was a comment made, raised earlier about the, kind of the form of, that the review should take. Um, I, I think I'm kind of, kind of fairly open as to what as to how the, re the review should be done. But um, the, 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 only, the only form of the review that, that it shouldn't take is for it to be solely done within the Scottish Government. So there has to be an element of external involvement because clearly this is a flagship policy. Any evaluation could come out with some pretty difficult, challenging messages, and it's important that they're appropriately aired. OK, thank you. And I certainly wasn't excluding um, our Scottish Government officials. Any comments you want to make? I've taken on board all of their views, um, as will um, ministers. OK. Well, uh, can I thank everyone for, for attending? Uh, that concludes that particular aspect. But before we move on from this agenda item, um, for any, anyone w watching at home, so we're finished this agenda item, there are no more questions for yourselves, but 
Um, before we move into private session, I know that Graham Simpson and Andy Whiteman attended a fact-finding visit in Linlithgow on Monday to meet with those who had worked on the Linlithgow plan for the future, a local plan developed by community groups. They also met with representatives of West Lothian Council. Uh, as we've done with previous uh, uh, community visits, can I invite uh, Graham and Andy if they want to make any remarks and, and how some brief remarks, hopefully, but some remarks on the public record in relation to how that, uh, that event went. Graham, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, very briefly, convener, um, you're right. Uh, we went to Lin Lithgow um, and we met uh, community groups who had been involved in uh, drawing up their own local place plan. Um, a very, I have to say, very Im impressive and thorough document. Um, they shared with us their, their experience of producing that. Um, their, I think it's fair to say, frustrations around the reaction to that from the local council. Um, so I think on, on uh, behalf of Andy and myself, I'd like to thank those that uh, came along. i uh, also like to thank uh, representatives of uh, West Lothian Council who, who met us later to, to give us their perspective. I think overall it was a very useful session. There'll be a paper produced for the committee, um, so I'm not going to go into chapter and verse on what we discussed, but um, I think you'll be... Uh, very interested to see uh, the, the paper that com comes out of it. So it's a very useful session, given that local place plans form uh, part of the planning bill, which we're going to be scrutinising. We really appreciate that. Andy, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr Simpson, for putting that on the record. So we are now complete with Agenda Item 2, and we now move to Agenda Item 3, which we previously agreed to take in private. We move into private session now. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>